welcome once again to the Sage, and thank you for having been with us. Oh, it's been absolutely fabulous. We've been talking to Natalia, Dr. Natalia Kanem, let me say it properly, the executive Natalia's director fine. of UNFPA, <laughs> but who is an old friend of mine. <laughs> and um, it's been wonderful, it's been rich, but there's still so much to discuss. Yeah, I wanted you to say the story of how we met. Ah, I'm coming to that, I'm coming to that. I'm coming to that, but I, I want you, before I go into that, to just tell us a little about your experience of Nigeria. Uh, I almost consider you a Nigerian. Absolutely, thank you. And just, I'm going to give you a little opportunity to talk a little about your life, you know, your work and life in Nigeria, which continues now, of course, even more importantly as executive director. And then we'll move on to that very intriguing last part of the discussion. Well, thanks, Dr. Kashi. You know, um, I hail from Panama. Panama is a beautiful country. It has a population of four million, in contrast to the 200 million and counting <laughs> here. And uh, it's the isthmus where the Panama Canal connects the two great oceans, Atlantic and Pacific. In Panama, uh, as a crossroads of the world, we've had um, people of African descent from the beginning of our, of our uh, 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 existence. And of course, the Amerindian indigenous people who are native to those lands. In addition, Europeans and Asians and uh, Arabs and everyone else is in a mix. So it's a very interesting uh, crossroads, much like Nigeria itself, because of your sailing culture and the coastal uh, life that you share in a continuum across the continent. So coming to Nigeria uh, initially as the student of the great Olikoye Ransom Kuti wow. was at the time, uh, a very exciting prospect of learning about tropical medicine as his medical student. But now, with the gift of hindsight, you realize that the exposure to some of these ideas and principles mm. of primary care, and Prof was a huge champion as a leading pediatrician around the world, but certainly as one of the great uh, fathers of public health here in Africa, of paying attention to the child under the age of five. And this increased my understanding that if you, I'm a pediatrician myself, if you want the baby to survive, mm -hmm. look to the mother. What happened to her early in her childhood mm -hmm. is going to follow her throughout the course of her life Absolutely. and affect her pregnancy, her well-being. And now we know so much about the state of the health of the mother, the mother's happiness. All of this contributes to happy, healthy baby as well. And family. And family. So mm. coming to Nigeria as a medical student in the heyday, um, booming economy, you know, up until today, everywhere I go, you meet Nigerians who are leading in their field. And that was certainly the case when I was here at the Lagos University Teaching Hospital. I also uh, went up to Ibadan, and I was posted in Ogbamasho, in a rural health posting, where as a student doctor, you had these beautiful interactions with simple people who didn't have a lot. You know, they wanted to come back the next day and bring you two eggs Aww. or a gift from their garden. But they understood this principle of mutuality, of helping each other. Mm -hmm. And I think also uh, it motivated me to want to do something about the types of preventable conditions that I was seeing as a young doctor. Tuberculosis, which there's an inoculation for. So if the health system is working, Professor Ransom Kuti always stressed primary care to prevent disease before it leads to all of the complications, right? Mm -hmm. And so these are principles that I've carried with me.
But I have to say to be here in Nigeria as a young person with music, with the textile, with the cultural elements, the pepper in the food, <laughs> <laughs> which just flattened me completely. Uh, it was very, very exciting. And many of my cohort uh, in the medical school and in the dental school um, included Caribbean uh, students who were supported by Nigeria with scholarships. Your Commonwealth links um, and the generosity of the people here led to this. My Ghanaian colleagues, so many of us are still in touch. Mm -hmm. We still love each other. We've been able to learn together and I think to have a real imprint on action. We understood that you don't have to be a big person. You don't have to be a man. You don't have to be somebody with a big name family in order to be able to help in your corner. And this, I think, is really wonderful because there's no greater pleasure than knowing that you've been able to make a difference, you know, in a bad situation. And so uh, for Nigeria, I think the uh, influence of women like Chief B.C. Ogunleye, who uh, famously led the Country Women Association of Nigeria, rose on the world stage to talk about things like hunger mm. and the woman farmer, and also uh, the ability of leadership, not just at the political level, but in the marketplace, the power of a culture that spans generations of understanding, that the uh, expectation of our ancestors is that we will prosper and live in peace. All of these are things that have been huge guidance for me as I think back to uh, the benefits of Nigeria the first time that I came. I returned as an official of the Ford Foundation that was extremely exciting. I met people like Dr. Friday Okonofwa, a young uh, obstetric researcher at that time. He was swimming against the current because he was very, very concerned about infertility, mm -hmm. the inability to have a child, mm -hmm. the condition of being called a barren woman. All of this has huge social stigma. And I was very pleased to be able to fund his early research and also to have the opportunity to discuss with him the high yield things that we're going to do. We can't do everything, so you have to choose. I mentioned that yeah. UNFPA has prioritized contraception, ending death and childbirth, and ending gender-based violence. But you also have to think um, at the community level, what should we prioritize? Mm -hmm. For me, that means midwives. Midwives save lives. We have to think at the national level, what do we prioritize? Gender equity in policy and then in deed. Mm -hmm. And of course, globally, there are huge problems, but the United Nations is there to try to overcome this through dialogue. And the dialogue on peace is so crucial for Africa right now. Many, many red flags and danger signs popping up all over the place. And I am looking to young people to be the solution that figures out a way to resolve disputes, conflicts are a part of life, but uh, picking up weapons and damaging uh, women in the process is never going to be the solution. So Nigeria has in fact, I think, been a wonderful gift in my life. My son who grew up here, he's called Mandela, is frequently back, he's a filmmaker, and you know the dominance of the Nollywood film industry has been amazing. I am so in love with the new generation of Nigerian musicians who are singing about love, who are singing about the pleasure that young people take in each other, and not misogynistic lyrics demeaning women and et cetera, et cetera. And now that this has gone viral around the world, I think that kind of spirit of caring for each other is a music that also helps to bring peace in our hearts. Mm. And that is where peace in the home and peace in the world begins. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. I'm about to move into the last segment and I'm going to ask you 
to share with us about sometimes my our viewers find this most captivating you're an amazing woman you've achieved so much but where did it all come from and before I let you answer and give you time to think about it let me share a with your kind permission, of course, about how we met. Actually, oh, yes. we met twice. Yes. Uh, <laughs> we did, it's true. <laughs> we met twice. And if, with your permission, I will share both. The first time was probably almost 20 to 30 years ago, during the period you were based in Nigeria. I was a young lecturer myself then, although a little older than you. <laughs> And I went to see the regional director of Ford Foundation because I was about to organize an international conference in Nigeria and needed the support of Ford. And I walked into that office and almost stepped back. I saw this lady, all I saw was a lady with dreadlocks. Ah, yes. <laughs> <laughs> sitting on the chair this thing that's called culture and so on um, I was startled I couldn't believe it I had to compose my face as I sat down you know and we started talking five minutes into the discussion I forgot all about dreadlocks I was just listening to the sheer intelligence, constructive discussion, wonderful questions that were coming out from this lady, and so on and so forth. And by the time I left the office, I kept saying to myself, hey, come, something just happened there. By the time I finished the one, one and a half, one hour to 30 minutes, one hour meeting, I didn't see dreadlocks. All I saw was a beautiful mind that had a, you know, a, wonderful, a wonderful grasp of the situation I came to discuss and so on. Now, tell you something, I'm making a public confession here. You did something to me that day that I have never forgotten. A lesson that I, have, I learned and which I think helped to shape my own life that in the end, in the final analysis, it's not your gender, it's not the color of your skin, it's what's in there and in here that matters. And you see, why I tell the story was on reflection, it must have taken a great deal of courage for that young lady that you were to have taken on the world. You, you were born a woman, a woman of color, perhaps coming from small Panama was also, to a certain extent, a greater disadvantage. Despite all those challenges, I, you showed me a spirit that fought the system. <laughs> that took on the world and say, well, if it's my hair and my color and my gender that is your problem, that's your problem. It's not mine. <laughs> I think I, th what a great I think story. I should. Like, that's so interesting. You might, you might not have thought of it that way, but so that's true. Is, yeah, yeah. But that was what it was because it took courage. It took courage at that time to to do it, to do dreadlocks, to sit in the office and say, "I'm regional director, whether you like my dreadlocks or not." <laughs> <laughs> and then the second time we met was years after. We then went our separate ways. I also joined the international development community. I joined UNFPA. And I think it took us like another 10, 15 years to meet again. And we met in New York. <laughs> yes. Together now in UNFPA. And she, she was saying, oh, I walked in Nigeria many years ago, and so on and so forth. I am Natalia Kanem. <laughs> I said, oh. I used to know a Natalia Kanem in those days in Nigeria. And she was saying, yeah. 
<laughs> and she was saying, yes, it's me. I didn't get it. I didn't see any more dreadlocks. I did. I saw, you know, so I didn't, it didn't. And then finally I said, oh, it was you. <laughs> Thank you so much well, for sharing know, the laughter with me. So but seriously, interesting. tell you us know, what, dr what drives you. How I did you remember yeah. vividly, and you know, I had patients on the ward when I was here as a student and then coming back as leader of, of Ford. Well, at first I was program officer, and then Maura McLean, who you may remember, was there as our boss, and then I moved up to become uh, 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 the representative myself. But you have this term in Yoruba, dada. Everywhere I went, people would call me this. Some with, <laughs> great, <laughs> some with great love and affection, and others were a little worried about it. Um, and I think you're right. Institutionally, um, I've always felt that it was important to have my natural hair. Black women spend Long a lot of time... Long before many of us thought, yeah. Uh, grieving about the state of their hair. And even as a kid, I remember my grandmother would always tease me, run and get the comb. I always kind of um, saw the beauty in Afro hair. Even today in the airport, I was mentioning to my colleague as we were um, in Frankfurt coming on to Abuja, there was a woman with massive natural hair and it was really, really beautiful to me. She was sitting there uh, doing her cell phone things. but. As a high official, even of the United Nations, I think it's very important for us to make space for people who feel othered. And so if you're the leader and you're coming to work, you know, dressed very nicely with gorgeous dreadlocks, I might say, <laughs> um, it gives permission for other people to do whatever they want. Absolutely. It has to be appropriate, but I think um, we have to also affirm that we are willing to make room in our heads for people who may not appear. You know, this is something that bothers me a lot because in the UN um, right now, we're trying to attract new African leaders. Once you retire, we have to replace you, right? And so the incentive to come in has to be genuinely welcoming. We don't want you to turn into someone else when you cross that threshold. Absolutely. But it's interesting. I am someone who is willing to challenge. I'm very concerned about justice and I have no problem being the person in the room who will make the comment to interrupt what I see as damaging behavior. It's not a problem for me. It can be sometimes um, discomforting. Sometimes people feel insulted when you say, well, you know, you really should not do that in that way. But it's important for them to understand that they're being observed and that everyone is equal and must be treated equally. We'll have a problem here, um, not just in Nigeria, but I think worldwide, because as you see, uh, women are clamoring for a seat at the table, mm -hmm. but now gender is being looked at through a different lens than ever before. So I believe that in order for people to make strides um, there is no value in demonizing the other. As African peoples ourselves, I think also, we come with a spirit of generosity, of curiosity, yeah. but also I think um, there is a lot of latitude for uh, better community-based dialogue. This is something that this year I've championed in the humanitarian situations where UNFPA works and where terrible things can happen but it's not discussed. Terrible things can happen and they must be discussed. This is the only way to prevent the next person from being victimized. What I actually thought was great about the story you told though was how um, ideas can spread because with your decision to convene an international meeting you know, there's some people who would have said, well, you're not ready, you haven't done it before, etc." But we all learn. And I think you had a fantastic opportunity, which you grabbed and benefited so many people who were privileged to be in that circle that you built. And in a way, that's kind of what you're still doing in terms of building a community now. Trying my best. Yeah, <laughs> well done. Really, really proud of that. Yeah.
Wow. Well, look, I um, would like to say that part of the success of UNFPA is its staff. And in Nigeria, we've been really pushed to think creatively how to work with communities because you're such a diverse country Absolutely. and geographically challenging country, but very beautiful country as well. And I think there are different types of languages like we tried to show in Nairobi where we had a Nigerian textile artist, uh, mm -hmm. Yemisi Ajayi, mm -hmm. and a gentleman who worked with uh, sculpture from found objects. Just to show that when we talk about the continuity of life, of reproductive health, of decisions around the value of women and girls, it's not just the ability to speak nicely in a meeting. It's really the day-to-day -day life of people. And it is women who weave, it's women who make soap, it's women who are potters, it's women who dye the indigo that is so renowned and beloved all over the world. There's a type of wisdom in somebody who can sit there patiently and make the basket grow and come to life. Yeah. And I think these are all metaphors for understanding that women and girls demand their respect, they're owed their respect, and to pledge that we will all make sure that we give them their due. So thank you, Ketchi, for what you've been able to do. Your career in UNFPA is legendary. <laughs> I think uh, through the uh, service that you gave in United Nations, you literally touched hundreds and thousands of women and girls, millions, really, when we think about the training manuals and the efforts that you did in terms of leading the contraceptive supplies program from its little footsteps to the huge program that it is today. And it's a blessing to have people who care, who are willing to step forward and willing to lead in the way that you have. I think it bolsters my leadership to be surrounded by other such people who are caring, but also determined to see that things change for the better. So congratulations to you and thank you for uh, inviting me. It's been quite a far ranging discussion. Natalia, thank you so much. I'm gonna be selfish. Usually I ask my guests to say a few last words, but after that beautiful, beautiful you um, say, yeah. statement to me, I don't know whether to leave it at that, but I will, I will ask you to just say goodbye to our uh, audience and um, what's the last few words to them? Stay hopeful and stay determined. This is a Nigeria that is a giant, not just in Africa, but in the world. And it's going to take all of us to work in concert to make the world better. So I believe that the world we want, the Africa we want, means that all hands have to be on deck. There is not a single person that can do it on their own. And my appeal always is to listen to the young people who are in your life, invite them to express their opinion, and make sure that, uh, in particular, young women are aware that you're going to be in their corner. You're going to help them. You're going to back them. And I assure you that UNFPA will do our best to do exactly the same thing. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank and you so much. And all the best. <laughs> we thank you all. It's been a great show. Um, she's done us a great honor. Um, pearls of wisdom, but also sharing and giving us the opportunity to know that this great organization called UNFBA is in the hands of a very remarkable, remarkable lady, um, Natalia. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. <laughs> we'll see you all next week.
I am very happy to be back on Nigerian soil after five years. As many of you know, I am a product of Nigeria, having been here at the medical school in Lagos at least. Today, UNFPA is looking after the reproductive health of countless women, girls, boys, men, everyone across this beautiful country. And my message is very simple. We need to assure that our adolescent girl can grow up secure, that her community is at peace, and that she has life-saving information that she needs to navigate a dangerous world if there is ignorance about sexual and reproductive health matters. While I'm here, I will be thanking the brave Nigerians that have helped the United Nations weather the COVID crisis with the country. And I look forward to very productive discussions with government, with community leaders, and certainly with the young people of this country who are brilliant, who are eager to develop this country, and who need big support, and that is what UNFPA uh, is here to do.